Hi, this is Dr. A with your clinical chemistry review video on magnesium, calcium, and phosphates. So let's start with magnesium. Magnesium is the fourth most abundant cation in the body. It is the second intracellularly behind um, potassium, which is the most abundant. It is involved in more than 300 different metabolic reactions, making it really important in human metabolism. Uh, it is involved in glycolysis, transcellular ion transport, neuromuscular transmission, synthesis of carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids, that's your DNA and RNA, and release of in response to certain hormones. Magnesium uh, is found in raw nuts, tri cereal, hard drinking water, or certain mineral waters, vegetables, meats, fish, and fruits. Uh, consumption of processed foods can lead to inadequate intake. So processed foods are, you know, your basic packaged junk food, even more frozen foods and stuff like that. Um, regulation of your body magnesium is controlled largely by the kidneys, which can reabsorb it in deficiency states or excrete it in excess. Clinical significance of magnesium, so hypomagnesemia, uh, is uh, the most common. So uh, causes are nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, CU stays, diabetes, and many more. Um, they can be due to decreased intake, decreased absorption, or increased uh, excretion. So decreased intake would be, of course, related to um, eating a lot of the junk food and stuff. Decreased absorption could be related to GI issues. Uh, where you're having so much inflammation in the GI tract it's not absorbing and uh, increased excretion would be through the kidneys, lo losing it through the kidneys obviously um, and potentially also through the diarrhea. Uh, hypermagnesemia, so high magnesium levels um, is rare uh, but could be due to excess intake of antacids or um, maybe a medication error where too much was given intravenously. Your laboratory procedure for the measurement of magnesium. Um, most colorimetric assays for magnesium use are chelating agents to prevent the interference from calcium. Uh, the methods are um, the calmagite, formazin dye, and methyl thymol blue. The specimen is going to be non hemolyzed serum or lithium heparin plasma. And the reference range for magnesium is 1.26 to 2.10 milligrams per dl. So it's very low levels. Uh, remember, of course, because your magnesium is inside of your cells, not so much in your blood. Next, we have calcium. So um, the extracellular calcium um, is needed for bone mineralization, blood coagulation, and other functions. So that's the uh, calcium that's floating around in the blood. But the calcium that's inside the cells, the intracellular calcium, um, its roles are in muscle contraction, hormone secretion, glycogen metabolism, and cell division. It is essential for myocardial contraction. You have to have enough calcium and enough calcium coming from your blood also into your uh, myocardium to con con you know, contract, otherwise you have problems. 99% of calcium in the body is part of bone. The remaining 1% is mostly in the blood and other extracellular fluid. And um, little is in the cytosol of most cells except for uh, muscle type cells. Of the total amount that is in blood, so of that 1%, 45% circulates as free calcium ions, 40% is bound to protein, and 15% is bound to anions. Your uh, blood ionized calcium is closely regulated and has a mean concentration uh, in humans of about 1.18 millimoles per liter. It is uh, ionized calcium is important to maintain um, during surgery and in critically ill patients. So they may analyze those ionized calcium levels in those uh, patient populations. Uh, a reminder of how calcium metabolism works. So if you have low blood calcium level, and this is always going to be about maintaining blood levels of calcium, not so much bone levels of calcium. So in low levels of calcium, your it will your parathyroid um, glands will detect that and will cause it to secrete parathyroid hormone. And uh, that will cause the breakdown of bone uh, so that it will release the calcium from the bone. It can also cause an increased absorption in the guts and reabsorption in the kidneys. Uh, and of course, that in turn um, raises the calcium levels back to normal levels. And if you have 
high level of um, blood calcium, so maybe you just took a bunch of calcium in or whatever, ate something that was really calcium rich, then uh, your thyroid gland uh, here in the, in the parafollicular cells, they produce calcitonin, and calcitonin will be produced in uh, reaction to high calcium levels, and that will cause uh, the calcium to move from the blood into the bone and normalizing the uh, serum, the blood cal calcium level. So 1,2,5-dihydroxyvitamin D is the active metabolite of vitamin D and parathyroid hormone regulate calcium. So in bones, 1,2,5-dihydroxyvitamin D uh, stimulates the osteoclast to uh, mobilize bone calcium. So this is the process called bone resorption. And bone resorption is the process of transferring calcium from bone to blood. So it's releasing calcium from bo bones to increase the levels in the blood. Parathyroid hormone acts on bones in the kidneys. In the kidneys, it increases the reabsorption of the renal tubular calcium, and it enhances also the hydroxylation of 25-hydroxyvitamin D to activate it into the active form that's 1,2,5-dihydroxyvitamin D. So hypocalcemia, or low calcium levels, can be due to vitamin D deficiency or the result of neck surgery, um, so if the parathyroid glands were disturbed, uh, so that's usually temporary. Um, can it also be due to magnesium deficiency, um, because if you are deficient in magnesium, it will inhibit the secretion of parathyroid hormone. Um, it can be caused by primary hypoparathyroidism, so again, not having enough parathyroid hormone, uh, renal disease, and rhabdomyolysis. Uh, hypercalcemia, or high calcium levels, can be caused by primary hyperparathyroidism, so having too much parathyroid hormone. Um, malignancy, so certain cancers can do that, um, and usually if uh, it's cancer-related, uh, the parathyroid horm hormone levels are normal to low. And uh, can all, hypercalcemia can also be seen uh, with increased intestinal absorption, increased renal retention, increased skeletal resorption, or as a combination of, of all three of those. The lab procedures for calcium, so it is important to point out that for calcium measurements is to never, never, ever use EDTA, the purple tops, citrates, blue top, or the oxalates as anticoagulants because they all bind calcium out of the blood as part of their anticoagulant process and so therefore there's not going to be any calcium in those to measure. The specimen of choice is serum or lithium hep heparin plasma. The measurement of ionized calcium does require a specimen that has not been exposed to air. And the method of measurement is orthocrystalline complex zone, or CPC, or the arsenizer 2 dye complex with calcium. The reference range for the total calcium is 8.6 to 10.0 milligrams per deciliter. And for ionized calcium in whole blood, it is 4.6 to 5.1 milligrams per deciliter. For phosphorus, the distribution is 80% in bone, 20% in soft tissues, and less than 1% in serum and plasma. Phosphate provides mineral strength to bone. It is an integral component of your nucleic acids, so your DNA and RNA, and it serves as a buffer in bone, serum, and urine for uh, acid-base balance. It is found everywhere in all the living cells in your body. It participates in key biochemical processes. It is regulated by renal excretion and reabsorption. Parathyroid hormone will increase phosphate excretion, and uh, vitamin D will increase absorption in the intestines and reabsorption in the kidneys. Uh, so phosphorus has an inverse relationship with calcium, so as you can see, parathyroid hormone increases phosphate excretion, so you get rid of phosphate, but it'll cause calcium reabs you know, absorption and stuff, so and calcium release. So basically, if phosphorus goes down, calcium goes up, and vice versa. The clinical significance of phosphorus in, um, so with hypophosphatemia, um, it is usually caused by an increased excretion due to hyperparathyroidism, but can also be seen in diabetic ketoacidosis, um, COPD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, such as like emphysema and chronic bronchitis, um, asthma, uh, cancer, um, irritable bowel disease, and alcoholism. And uh, decreased excretion is the most common cause of hyperphosphatemia due to acute or chronic renal failure. 
the laboratory procedures or ammonium monobate method on unhemolyzed serum. And in that method, you have the formation of an ammonium phosphomolybdate complex, which is proportional to the amount of phosphate, and that is what is measured. The reference range is 2.4 to 4.4 milligrams per deciliter. And that is it. Thank you for your attention.